Good morning, everyone. Welcome to service this morning. It's a lovely day. Thank the God. Thank God for this, that you've got good company to share it with. Welcome to all visitors worshiping with us this morning, and and for those on live stream. Our minister Rob is in Mirabara preaching today, and they're also having communion down there today. So, and we've got Terence. McCorkle, oh yeah, he's here. <laughs> he's, he's preaching with us today for us here. So please join us for a cup of tea after the service. We'd love to have you join us and, and in fellowship. Uh, we have a prayer group that meets on Sunday mornings before the service at 8.30am in the hall. All welcome. Ladies Craft and Fellowship Group meet Wednesday mornings in the hall starting at 9.30am. You're welcome. And Growing Godly Women is a Bible study for women which is held monthly on a Saturday morning at 9.30am. The next study will be on April the 27th here at the church. So see Roz Anderson for details. I don't know where Roz is. She's here. She has been here. Oh, there she is up the back there with her husband, Graham. Uh, Bible studies Wednesday night starting at 7 p.m. and Friday morning at 10 a.m. Both are held in the church hall. All welcome. Youth Bible studies held on Friday nights between 5 and 8 p.m. This is for high, all high school age students and young adults. Uh, the elders and committee of management meet every third third Tuesday of the month, so next, next Tuesday we meet at, uh, if you have any spiritual or physical matters that need attending to, please speak to an elder or committee of management member before they meet. Now there'll be no men's breakfast, um, Rob is going to organise something else to replace it at a later date, but for, there'll be no men's breakfast next Saturday morning, so if you rock up you'll have to cook your own bacon and eggs. So. You'll have to bring them too. <laughs> uh, we are holding an apologetics workshop, Defending Christ in a Secular Society. Come and learn how to change life conversations into gospel conversations. Saturday, May the 18th, starting at 9am and finishing at 3pm here at the church. The cost is $10, which includes lunch. And the speaker is Dr Mark Brad Badley. He's... Um, He's well, well, well known in, in this field. So, uh, register online or see Rob of one of the elders. We have an evening service this afternoon starting at 4.30 p.m. Our youth are leading this service. Uh, we will be having a sausage sizzle after the service all welcome. So it's wonderful to see our youth stepping up, uh, preaching and running the service this evening. Now, there's no birthdays today, but congratulations to my darling wife, Alison, on 23 years of marriage today. When, uh, when, when I first met her, she had four young children. I thought, I don't want, I don't want to get tied up with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she looked at me and thought, he's pretty old, I don't want to get tied up with him. <laughs> But here we are, 23 years later, and now she's got her seventh grandchild on the way, and that makes Bill and Letty their seventh great-grandchild. And, and, of course, Auntie Tonya, another one, another niece or nephew or whatever's coming. And so thanks, thanks be to God for we're still going strong. We're not falling apart, so maybe there may, God may bless us with many more years to come. Um... Now, so I'm leading the service today. The, our, our call to worship this morning is from Micah 7, 7 to 8. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. 
Now, well, apparently last time I had you sitting and standing, you didn't know when to sit and when to stand, so hopefully I'll get it better this time. We'll stand for this one and stay standing and for, until the next uh, hymn. The first one is Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. prayer. Gracious Lord, bind us together in your love. Give us the courage to stand together for you and your kingdom. Lead us to know you better as we meet today for your glory. Amen. And now we'll sing again for nothing but the blood.
everybody see it? Thank you. Confessional prayer this morning. Forgive us, Lord God, as we bring our confessions to you. We have not always acted as we should in thought, word, and deed. Please have mercy on us. In a silent prayer for yourselves. the assurance prayer, Almighty God, we come before you recognising that through Jesus we can have forgiveness of our sins. Thanks to your never-ending love for us, we can have the assurance of eternal life without the suffering we endure on earth. Amen. So we'll stand again for the next uh, hymn, O the Mercy of God. going to have a time of giving 
now for the stewards. Gracious Heavenly Father, may these offerings given here and online be used to your glory and to your pleasure. Amen. Uh, the intercessory prayer. Lord, gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you acknowledging your creation of the universe and all that is in it, seen and unseen, and us as part of it, in your likeness to do your will. Bless us, O Lord, we pray. Guide us through your Holy Spirit in your righteousness. Bind us together in your love proven through your Son on the cross for our sins and his resurrection to give all those who believe and have faith walking in your ways to eternal life. Please bless this congregation. Guide us to lead others who do not know you to eternal glory by your grace only. Please be with those that are suffering and in infirm in our congregation and help them in their afflictions. We think of Beth Richardson, Letty Moffat, Elaine Went, George O'Neill, Gwen May, and anyone else, Lord, that we do not know about, but you do. Please help the leaders in this world to find a way for peace through you. Please put in their hearts to stop the suffering. Lord, please be with all Christian churches and Christian political leaders that follow your word, that your kingdom may grow and there be a reformation to you, Lord. Be with your missionaries across the world, sometimes in dangerous places. Please keep them safe. Lord, please be with the RE teachers and the chaplains for the young and the elderly. Let more volunteers come forward and bless them with encouragement and finances. Bless the nurses, doctors, ambos and fireys and all emergency services. Lord, please be with our military as the world threatens for more conflict. Lord, you are the answer to all our problems and it is in you we put our trust. Through your son, Jesus Christ, our saviour, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. I think Tony is going to, oh sorry, I was, I was too quick. <laughs> um, Tony is going to lead us in word this morning. Our Bible reading comes from the first chapter of John's letter. 
find first John if you're looking in your Bible towards the end of your Bible just before Jude or just before second John actually but 1 John chapter 1 reading the entire chapter that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him, and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. May God bless us through the reading of his word. Amen. The sermon from that word. Good morning. Well, it is a pleasure indeed to be here again this morning and to be able to share from God's Word. I was just thinking to myself a moment ago, what gives a mere mortal in some random place like Harvey Bay the right or the courage to speak about the words of the immortal, all-powerful God? Um, I think in order to do that, we, uh, I would like to pray for his help this morning. Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you for the privilege that you have given us to handle your word. And we thank you for the grace that you have given us that we can even approach you. And we pray this morning that as we come to this, that we will see more of you and less of us. Uh, we pray that you will speak to us directly to our hearts as we read and think about your words this morning. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. For a few weeks, Rob is away. So you're going to hear 1 John chapter 1, 2, 3 and 4, a week at a time, from different people. Um, and so I'm kicking that off this morning. Uh, we have not coordinated with each other, okay? So uh, each person's just doing what the Lord lays on their heart as they go. And as you know, this chapter, we've just read an entire chapter. It's quite short, isn't it? Short chapter, but full of like a punch. It is a big punch. It's dense. Uh, and there's so much to say and think about and to learn from this little passage that I feel this morning I can't do it justice 
in a bit of a, a snap here in, in one sitting. So if you, you know, this is going to be like skimming a rock across the surface of a river. And if you want to dive in deeper, um, you can do that in your time. And I encourage you to do that because the more you consider the words of the living God, uh, the more they will change you. This book does not start off with a, a thing that says, uh, written by John. Okay, his name is not listed in this book as the writer, but it is generally and unanimously agreed that he is the one who wrote it. He answers some issues of the day, of the day back then, and I would like to suggest this morning of our day, some major, major issues that you and I face Frequently, in fact, I suspect so frequently that we don't even notice half of the time. And when you think about the world we live in, in comparison to what we're about to explore in the first book of John, um, you realise more and more and more how vastly different um, God's framework is from the one we are so accustomed to living in. And so I think what we're about to read uh, reveals a lot to us about the world that we live in. I would like to call today's message, I don't know whether my clicker works, there you go, the real deal. Okay, the real deal. You hear uh, that phrase thrown around a lot, don't you? The real, is it the real deal? Okay. Um, who is God? Who is God? The country you and I live in, we don't want to answer that question. Because if we answer the question then we're locked into some kind of a consequence of it. But if you speak to people broadly, um, you will find that question of who is God uh, on their lips. Who, who is God anyway? I mean, surely you worship whoever you want, I'll worship whoever I want. These are, this is the sort of culture we live in, and we are crying out to know what is the real deal. What is the real deal? Is it true what I believe in? Or does it matter? So there's three things that I've decided uh, to put up as little things to remember this morning. And so if you go to sleep after this slide, at least you've seen the main points, okay? So the main points I've put up there, first of all, is that knowing God is a mat not a matter of opinion. It is a matter of fact. I'll come to that, okay? Next one is, God is light. Now, I tried to change this slide just before church because um, I'd changed my mind about what I'd written in red there. I wrote, God is light and everything else is darkness. Now, the scripture doesn't actually say that, okay? That's why I wanted to change it to what it says. And it says, God is light and in him there is no darkness. Um, this, I think, my statement here, I apologize for it. I can't change it now because it's kind of locked in the system somewhere. Um, but what I meant to say was God is light and anything that is not of God is darkness. Okay, so um, a very stark statement. And last of all, we are born sinners in darkness, but God offers forgiveness of sins. Is that good? That is very good. You know, um, sometimes when you face up to the truth, you don't like what you find out. The truth is, we're all sinners. We, we don't like to know that. But if it's true, if it's true, then we also need to know that God says um, that there is forgiveness available for our sins. So today, in, in exploring these ideas in this short passage, we're going to take the journey as follows. I'd like to just think about the context of this passage and of our own country that we live in before we look at what the passage might say to us in that context. So we're going to look at the first little bit there, first few verses is about the word. What is the word? The next little section is the message because it says in uh, the beginning of verse 5, this is the message. What is the message? And the second thing, the third thing rather, is what is our response? Surely we cannot read the word of God and just have no response. In fact, I would say that a response of apathy or shrugging your shoulders at the words of God is a response. Not a good one, but you know, we must respond properly to what we know and learn from God's word. 
let's jump into the context, a little bit of context. Let's look at our context, first of all, and the comments I made earlier about the country we live in uh, and the things that you might have come across. Here's some big words for your uh, dictionary. Pluralism. See how many of these you recognise. Syncretism, individualism, empiricism. Do you like that one? Fatalism, agnosticism, atheism, animism, deism. And if you take the A off agnosticism, you get Gnosticism. Now, there's a lot of these. I just filled up the screen uh, before I thought, well, that'll do. Okay, there's a lot of isms. And uh, they're, all, they're all a bit different. What are all these things? These are people's um, approaches to understanding God, let me say, something like that. Okay, so for example, not sure whether you can see that very well up there, but pluralism, in a nutshell, means uh, many beliefs. Okay, you can believe that, I'll believe this, we all believe different stuff, we all get along happily because we think that's okay, pluralism. Syncretism in a nutshell, we blend the beliefs. You know, you believe a bit of this, I believe a bit of that. Why don't we put it together and come up with a, the best of everything, okay? Syncretism. It kind of sounds like synchronised, doesn't it? Empiricism. Now, we get quite a lot of empiricism going on in our world, and that is, you, it sounds like the word empirical, empirical knowledge, stuff that you can see and touch. I'll only believe it if I can see it. That's empiricism, okay? Sounds cool. You can say that to someone next time and they'll think you're really smart. Fatalism. Fatalism means, well, what's going to happen is going to happen and I can't control it anyway and so I kind of think the future is preset, okay? Fatalism. What about individualism? Have you seen a lot of that around this country? Individualism. I am the middle of everything, and if it's true for me, it's true, and what matters matters to me, and whatever, you know, you worry about yourself. So I believe that I am at the centre of my existence. Individualism. Atheism. A. Theism. No God. No God. I believe there is no God. Agnosticism. Now, this one is a belief that you can't really know God. Some people misuse that word, and they go, well, I'm an agnostic. And what they mean to say is, I don't really want to look into this deep enough to make up my mind. But that's not what the, the kind of real meaning of this is. The real meaning is that um, I believe that God is unknowable. So I won't keep looking into it because he is beyond finding out. I cannot know that. So that's where the argument stops. Agnosticism. Not so would be Gnosticism which you don't hear a lot about, but it, believe, it, it is this idea that God, or deity, if you like, is this kind of word, the word. They, they would use this phrase, the word. I think I was watching a, a totally non-religious thing once uh, on YouTube in the last few months where a university student raised a question with someone and he was talking about the Logos. You go, oh, that sounds like you know, biblical Greek. Well, it's just Greek, right? And so people do use that same word to mean, you know, the collection of the things which are true and right. And then anything that you can see and touch is some kind of derelict form of existence and there is, therefore is bad. So in a very, very broad stroke nutshell, um, people who are Gnostics would believe that the physical world is bad and that the word, you know, whatever that might be, exists outside of our physical world, but we can know it if we get special revelation of it. And so I go, well, I've, I've got special revelation of God, but you can't really know all of God, and so someone else might get their special bit, and maybe you'll be unlucky and you'll miss out. You know, so that's the Gnostic view of the world. And my understanding is that this is the... A, a prevailing belief that was going on at the time where this passage of First John was written. Okay, so that's why I've put all this stuff up there, because, not so that we can learn about another 150 false religions, you know, um, but because we face this cloud of beliefs all the time, and that's the one that was going around. So, um, what 
funny place would have such a collection of beliefs, Australia does, okay? Our place, our place. And so if you walk along the Esplanade this afternoon and w talk to people about God, you will get views like these ones. These ones, sorry, I'm pointing at the wrong screen. These ones. So you'll get people that believe all of these kinds of funny things. Um, and in John's day, in particular, that Gnosticism one was an issue. Now, this is why I said... First John is like a meaty punch. He doesn't start off by fluffing around, right? Imagine writing to a group of people who think that if you can see it and touch it, it's bad, and you can't really know all about God, let alone actually know him, okay? You might gain pearls of wisdom through your life. And he writes this, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard and seen with our eyes, okay, alarm bells, straight away, <laughs> he can be seen and heard, okay, um, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Wow. So if you were a Gnostic at the time, you would read that and be shocked, right? This is the opening sentence to this letter Okay, that the, the word, the word, this, this thing that we all look up to but can never quite know, John says he's heard it, looked at it, studied it, and touched it. Okay, that is, that is very, very, very provocative to these people who at the time would have been reading this letter. And so it's like he's not warming up to this message. He's hitting them with his first punch right at the very start. And so you can see that that statement, that statement, what does it say about all this stuff? See, in Australia, we have what I would call like the cereal aisle of religions, don't we? And the approach there, you know what it's like, you go to the shop, and this is not just for like a little joke, this is true, right? You go to the shops and you will get a massive array of different cereals or shampoo or any other thing and they've been made to be bigger littler this color that color with honey without honey and you go you can order whichever one you want that's okay I mean you like you like that one I like this one that's okay we'll all get some nutrition out of it you know and so we have this view and it's very very deeply built into our psychology that first of all we need choice Number one, we need choice. It's good. Choice is good. And the choice you make, that's your choice. You can't tell me that Wheat Bix is the best. It might be the best for you on a Monday, but it's not the best, you know, because I like Cocoa Pops. And so people have this kind of thing built into them that that is how our world works best. And we transfer that concept over to faith. And we go, well, you can choose any God you like, we're all striving after something after all, and it's okay, it's okay. You know, we'll all get there in the end. And John is saying, that is wrong, okay? That is wrong. So when it comes to all of these things like animism, secretism, empiricism, and every other ism, these are matters of opinion and ideology. Matters of opinion and ideology. And so we could argue till the cows come home about, you know, whether things that you can't touch are real and whether we can, oh, whatever, okay? It's all opinion. Uh, John says, guess what? I have seen, touched, and heard the word. Okay, that's not a matter of opinion. That is a matter of fact, Okay, which is why my first point that I made earlier is that knowing God is not a matter of opinion, it is a matter of fact. If you lived at the time of Jesus and you saw him, and it is a matter of faith, sorry, it is a matter of faith, but it's also a matter of fact. What, what John is saying here is that, that Jesus and his Godhood is true. It's not a matter of like, well, it's good for me, it might not be good for you. It is a fact. That's what he's saying. 
let's have a little look at the, and answer this question to be sure, of who is this passage talking about, okay? We've probably all arrived at the conclusion many times over that it's talking about Jesus. Let's just explore that and, and look at some uh, questions or interesting things about that statement. Okay, so the first thing I noticed when I read through this passage is that all the way through up until, you know, where that last highlighted word is, all of those pronouns are impersonal, aren't they? It doesn't say him and he. It says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which we have looked at. This we proclaim, the word of life. It doesn't sound initially like a person. Now, there are some grammatical practicalities in relation to how John has put this, but I would also like to suggest that this is probably the language of a Gnostic person. They would not see God as their personal friend or saviour. And so he's saying, hey, all that, all, that, all those things that you talk about, I have seen him because he changes halfway down the passage and he says, he says, and our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. And so he changes from their language to his language and suddenly he's saying that, it's, it reminds me of Paul's sermon to the, um, to the Greeks of believing all sorts of gods. You've got all sorts of gods I notice you have one to the unknown God. Let me tell you about him. So you people are looking for the word. You people are looking for this ever-existent thing. Hey, I've met him. I've met him. And of course, uh, then he launches into um, this description. So that's one thing I just would like to note. The other thing I'd like to note is who he describes this one as. He describes him as the one who is from the beginning, from the beginning. This is not talking about from creation. If you think back to um, the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John starts off with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it goes on to say that everything was created through him. In other words, he pre-existed creation from the beginning, the beginning before the beginning, okay? This is the beginning that we're talking about. So he was from eternity past. And we've heard him. It means he's real. He is the word of life. That means he holds the wisdom of God. This life appeared like Jesus did. He then refers to him as eternal life and says he was with the Father and has appeared to us. Now, anyone in John's time would have known that Jesus was crucified. And so if he has appeared to them since that point, it is an implication, it implies that he's also, and if he's with the Father, he was also resurrected. Okay, it doesn't say it in this passage, but it, it, it is a necessary fact for him to make these statements. So these are all the clues of who he is talking about. And so if we think about Jesus, he existed in eternity past. He is the eternally existent word, referred to in John chapter 1, as I said. Um, he appeared as a human in the real world to be touched and heard. He was resurrected. He relates and fellowships with us and is equal with God. That is a massive, massive statement to make to somebody who believes that God is a little bit beyond us. Now, if you add to this statement the words of Jesus who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody comes to the Father except through me, that wipes away all other options that you might have ever considered. So, John would not be popular today in Australia. Is he offering choice, variations, interesting options? You know, no, he is saying there is one. He has met the one. 
that one is God. And when we, and we read in John's Gospel, if we put that all together, there is no other way to the Father, to salvation. That's it, right? What a massive punch to all the things that you and I hear on the streets. So what about syncretism? Can we have a bit of this and a bit of that? No, there's only one way. What about pluralism? Can you believe this and I'll believe that? No, there's only one way. What about agnosticism? Is it true that you can't really know? John met him. You can know him. John, John met him. He's revealing to us the truth about someone he met. He met God manifest in flesh. And so what about um, deism? Deism is this belief that God sort of spun the world into action and then left it go its own way. No, because God came to us, came to us. You and me, he has come to personally. And so all these isms are done away with in a few short sentences at the beginning of this book. What, what a punch that is to the culture that you and I live in. So the first statement I just wanted to make is remember that knowing God is just not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of fact. God is real and we can know him. The second little step in this um, passage that we've read is in verses 5 to 7. It says, this is the message that we have heard, not that we made up or that we think, that we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. I was chatting to Josh yesterday and he said that he heard from someone that the period known in history as the Enlightenment probably should be called the Endarkenment, okay? Because unless people come to know more and more of God, they are not more enlightened. But you hear that very word used, I've heard it used, in circles um, it, it, where people are trying to do away with God. You know, are you so old-fashioned that you still believe all that stuff? You know, I'm more enlightened. The word enlightened means sort of, you know, I embrace more things than you do, so I'm enlightened. John says, God is light. So if there is anything else that claims to be light, it is not light unless it is of God. And that's it. And that's it. This is not the message of a bigot. This is just a man telling you the way it is. This is the truth. So when we live in a society which is clouded with stuff and opinions and ideas and ways and ways not to and whatever, you need someone to go, let's just cut through it and focus on the truth. And this is what John is giving us. This is the message. So how does, how does John describe light and darkness. I thought this little visual might help us just to kind of uh, see it in, in coloured dots, okay? In the first one there, number one, you've got black dots and white dots and grey dots. You know, this kind of depicts the idea that you have some light, I have some light, he doesn't have light, you might have a bit of something in the between, you know, whatever. We're all on the journey, we're all on the journey. Um, that's what I would call individualism, Okay, we are all at the center of our own bubble. Number two, you know, there is a truth. There is a truth. And there is darkness. And somewhere there's a grey section in the middle, you know, and we kind of live in that area sometimes because we can't quite find, you know, that's what I would call syncretism. We try to blend them a little bit and come with a comfortable in-between. I, I might have said this before, but we have, I have met a number of people who express exactly that. If you go walking along the Esplanade and you talk to people about the gospel, they'll go, oh, no, I've got, I've got my beliefs, mate. Thanks for that. I've got my beliefs. What does that mean? What does that mean? I've gathered a bit of things that, you know, and I've got a, a collection of things that I like that I think suit me. Okay, so it just blended a bunch of ideas. I knew a lady once, I worked with a lady, who said, oh, well, I don't believe that Jesus died on the cross because I don't like blood. Okay, so she wasn't seeking the truth. She was seeking something that was satisfactorily comfortable to her. 
So she had a little bit of light. She, just, she did believe that Jesus lived. A little bit of darkness. She swooshed them all together. And so what she got was not of God. Because it says, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Okay, so she had her own little grey area. I think what John is describing is point three. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. This is a challenge to us. Then he says, if we are walking in the light, you'll notice he doesn't say, if you enter the light. I have entered the light. You know, he doesn't say that. That is not the the phraseology. Because if you enter the light, uh, that's just like a one-off event. This is talking about how we live. We are walking daily in the light, okay? If we are walking in the light, we have fellowship with one another. This reminds me of our messages from previous uh, times, you know, maybe this year, earlier, um, where we were talking about our unity as brothers and sisters in Christ. Our unity and our fellowship is not because we drink the same tea or coffee or because we stand around, you know, we use that word fellowship, don't we? Oh, we're having some fellowship together. It means we're eating cake or something, okay, together. This is not fellowship in that sense. This is fellowship, okay? A fellow person is a person who is, you're on their page, and this is the state of being together on the page of unity in Christ. We only are united through one thing. Otherwise, we are not united. We are, not, we are united in Christ if we are walking in the light. So the consequence of you and me walking in the light as he is in the light is that we have fellowship with one another. Wow. So boil it all down the swirling mass of multiple opinions out there, we cut to it and we come to the truth and we follow this truth and as a result, we have fellowship together. Okay? Fellowship together. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Now, we we could dig deeper into that too. I feel like our time will get away. So, point two to remember is that God is light And I'd like to rephrase that to exactly what John says. And in him there is no darkness at all. Anything that is not of God is darkness. The third little section then says, if we claim... I love the way John says things one way and then says them the other. You know, God is light. But if you claim... You know, like he sort of makes sure you you didn't wriggle out the back door. Okay, so it says it this way and that way, and there's boundaries then. So if we claim to be without sin, who do we deceive? Do we deceive our neighbours? We might, okay, but unlikely. Because if you say to your neighbour, hey, I am sinless, they'll go, (laughs) you know. The first person you deceive is yourself. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. It doesn't say not a little bit in us, notice, okay? It's not like I'm the truth, you know, you're just on the edges of the truth. It doesn't talk like that, okay? If you claim to be without sin, the truth is not in you. But if you confess, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Wow, there is the message of the mercy and grace of God after putting this in such black and white and unattainable terms, God is light. And unless you are walking in the light, you are in darkness. And you go, well, what hope is there for any of us? Well, there is hope, brothers and sisters, because he can purify us from our sins. Okay, this is the the wonderful news of the message of salvation through the work of Jesus Christ, whom John met heard and touched. So we confess our sins to God and if we, then it says if we claim we have not sinned, just to make sure you didn't miss it, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So you're not just deceiving yourself, you are actually throwing it back in the face of God if you say you haven't sinned. And there's a lot of people that say that. There are a lot of people who say, we are born essentially good. We're good. 
you know, people are good. And um, I know some people, oh, they're so nice. You know, they're not bad, not bad people. And we kind of try to argue our way into thinking that we are essentially good. We slip up, you know, we slip up from time. We don't want to use the word sin. So we use this watered down language, okay? Um, if we claim to be without sin, we are making God out to be a liar. How do we make God out to be a liar? Because the scriptures that existed at the time that John wrote this was the Old Testament. That's, they would have been well conversant with that. Here are a few verses from the Old Testament. Isaiah 64, 6. God says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like polluted garments or filthy rags. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20, the writer says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does, not, who does good and never sins. So, so the writer of Ecclesiastes didn't need to read John's gospel to know that. The fact of us all being sinners has been true ever since Adam and Eve fell in the garden. Jeremiah chapter 17, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And then how dare any of us come along and go, except for me, okay? Except for me. Anyone who claims to not have sin um, is making God out to be a liar. And just again, the good news that I share this morning and feel excited about for all of us is that he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And so uh, this is not a message of hard-hitting um, damnation. This is a message of hope to people who live in a world that they're confused and they don't really understand who God is. And they're trying to make a, a framework for understanding God. And maybe they've got enlightenment and maybe they haven't or maybe they believe this and where can we really find the truth and I just hope it works out and all that kind of stuff. And John is going, this is the truth. Here he is. I've seen him. I've touched him. He is God and he can save you from your sins. Wow. What a marvelous message to hear in a society full of confusion. Is our society confused? I think it is. Happily confused, actually. I think some people love the cereal aisle idea, okay? Because if I stay there, I, I know... I don't really have to make a decision about anything. I don't have to realise that all the garbage I heard taught to me at school or in the workplace or down the street or on television, I don't have to really reckon with it against the truth. I can kind of go, oh, you know, it's all, you know, I can stay in this airy, fairy, fuzzy sort of zone. How does this speak to us as people who love the Lord and go to church? Well, I think the message for me is... Don't get trapped by this stuff. It's easy to be a follower of the Lord and get dragged off to one side believing a whole bunch of stuff that's not true. It sounds reasonable sometimes. What if you're a person who's been avoiding God and you, you don't want to face up to God because you know you've got some stuff, baggage issues, hurts, unsolvable problems, and you kind of go, well, I just... It's in the too hard basket. I'll call myself an agnostic. You know, I've got a tag. That's okay. There's a lot of those around. So, yep, this is saying stop. Stop. Jesus is real. Salvation is available. What if you are a person who's been hurt by other Christians and you're using that, uh, you feel it's hard to come to God. It's hard to come to God because of all the issues and uh, problems that come with that. And you go, I can't face going to church. I don't really want to talk about the Bible because there's been so much damage done in my life with that over time. The good news about what John says here, he does not say, uh, he does not say the church is the source of truth. He takes us directly to God, directly to God, not via the priest not via a process, not it, straight to God. He says, we saw him and touched him and we can have fellowship with him and we can come directly to God. 
issues of hurt, issues of avoiding God, issues of confusion, all belongs in the darkness. And we will all face it in different ways when we are dealing with issues of faith because we live in a fallen world. So point three is that we are born sinners in darkness, but God offers forgiveness of sins. Wow. Quick summary. Light. People who are walking in the light, just from this short passage, and I say, we've just skimmed across the top of it, haven't we? They trust in the real God. The real God. They walk with God. Not just know about God, walk in the light. They can fellowship with other believers because they have a common father. They fellowship with God. They walk in the light, as I said. They are not walking in darkness. John's clear about that. They, there's another phrase he uses, which we can't really even have time to get into, that they live out the truth. They don't know the truth just, okay? They live it out. They actually live the truth. They can be purified from their sins. Wow. Wow, just imagine, and I don't want to dwell on our sins, but imagine the collection of sins between all of us, you know? And here we are. Here we are. You know, someone once said, sharing the gospel is like one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. You know, we're all in this together. We were born into it, but we can be purified. Wow. We can be forgiven. Darkness, on the other hand, is false gods and idols, not walking with God, no fellowship with believers. You can have a cup of tea with them, but you're not having fellowship together proper Christian fellowship if you're not sharing the same faith. No fellowship with God. You walk in darkness. You don't walk in light. You live a lie, it says. It says you make out God to be a liar. You're not purified from your sin. You have unconfessed sin. And you make God out to be a liar. I would like to tell you this morning that the light that John talks about is the real deal. It's the real deal. This is not a story. It's not just the Presbyterians' view of this idea to make you feel good for Sunday, to last you through the week. Okay, this is the real deal. You can walk with God. Wow. Wow. And I'd like to tell you that if you are living out of the other column, the darkness column, and if you think that's okay, then you have been scammed. I thought there's a modern word for us. Okay? Scammed. You have been deceived out of, out of the wonder and joy of walking with God, if that's what you think is okay to do, worshipping idols, following a bit of this, a bit of that, and not walking in light. We know a lot of people that have been scammed. We live among them. We work among them. We talk to them. And they are, some happily scammed, others searching wishing they could find their way out. John tells us the answer here. We can walk in the light. So there's our three points um, to remember. And I'd like to leave us with a verse from Colossians chapter 2 today. Um, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which may be, I'll just point out, because we talked about this verse earlier in the year, Um, I think Rob was talking about, it may be all the isms out there, or it might be issues in our own heart of religiousness and hooking our hopes on things that we do, whatever that philosophy is, anything that is not of God, anything that depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Christ, our Saviour, our eternal future and hope. Christ, who is the way, is the truth and is the life. Let's praise his name. Father, thank you for these words this morning. We find them so hard-hitting, so strongly worded, but Father, we need it because we work in 
a place which is so fuzzy at times. And Father, we just want to say thank you to you for the salvation that you offer us, that you can pull us out of this confused world that we live in and uh, consider us to be one of your children. Father, I pray for anyone here today who has not, uh, is not walking in the light. Father, please um, reach into their life and, and steer them towards you. Father, I pray for people who are walking in the light. Please uh, stop us from being taken captive by hollow philosophies. Father, we thank you for your word and I just pray that you will help us to keep uh, you and your word and your truth at the forefront of everything we do as the starting point for the things we do this week. I pray this now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, thanks be to God, that was certainly enlightening. Now, we're going to stand and sing in Christ alone, number 1072. Benediction, 
Acts 26, 16 to 18. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And we'll finish with all glory be to Christ. Thank you.